Okay, and we're live from the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand. Uh, thank you very much all for coming here tonight. My name is Phil Robertson. I am a board member of the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand, and I want to welcome you all uh, to this event to talk about Thailand's draft nonprofit organizations law. But before I do that, I wanted to uh, take an opportunity to make a few public service announcements. We have some uh, very interesting upcoming events at the club that you may want to attend, and I'm going to just tell you a few words about them. Uh, this coming Monday, the 24th of January, we're going to be celebrating resilience, uh, the sounds, images, poetry, and tastes of Myanmar. Uh, so you can come. We'll have musical performances. We'll have poetry readings by celebrated poets. We'll have Burmese food. It's being done in conjunction with uh, Sea Junction. We're also going to have a photographic exhibition, which is why the, the photos are all down right now. A women on, out on the streets for a new Burma, which is courtesy of Sea Junction. Uh, that will be uh, starting at 6.30 p.m. on Monday the 24th, and I hope you'll come. Uh, the next, uh, on the 26th, which is a Wednesday, we will be having uh, a panel discussion about uh, the what's next for Thailand's youth movements calls for monarchy reform. Uh, obviously a very hot topic. Uh, we'll have a number of speakers. Uh, my very good friend and colleague, uh, Panu, who is the president of the FCCT, will be moderating that panel. And uh, that should be very, very interesting. Um, so that's on the 26th, again, starting at 6.30. And then on the excuse me, on the 25th, uh, the day before that, there will be a panel on education during the pandemic, challenges in the way forward. And uh, that event will uh, start at 6.30, and it's gonna be looking at um, all issues of education connected to the pandemic and what it's meant for not only children, but also for the schools, the teachers, and all the others who are engaged in education of the young. So those are three events coming up and I hope you'll be able to come. So <clears throat> we're here tonight to talk about the government's proposed draft law. It's called officially the Draft Act on Operation of Nonprofit Organizations, or NPOs, as the government calls them. Most people refer to these organizations actually as NGOs, but as I'm uh, sure you'll hear from the panelists, the definition of MPO in this draft law is very expansive. And I just wanted to take a few moments to say where we are in the state of play for the consideration of the draft law before turning it over to the panel to discuss what it means. The current draft of the law that we will be talking about tonight uh, was agreed in principle uh, by the Thai cabinet on the 4th of January this year. And the cabinet has now sent that draft to the Ministry of Social Development and Human Security, or MHG, MSDHS, or Paul Ma, as they call it in Thai, to organize a consultation in line with Article 77 of the current Thai Constitution. Uh, <clears throat> per that section of the Constitution, here I quote, quote, prior to the enactment of any law, the state shall conduct consultation with the stakeholders, thoroughly and systematically assess possible impact of the law, and disclose, disclose results of the consultation and assessment to the public, as well as taking such results into consideration at every stage of the legislative process. Now, I will say that the FCCT did invite the MSDHS minister, uh, Duty Kairik, uh, or a designated representative to speak today. Unfortunately, the, the minister declined to come and also declined to send any representative. And as an aside, I would say this is not a terribly auspicious start to a consultation process uh, by the ministry. However, there is an online comment process that's been created which will uh, receive comments from January 18th to March 5th this year. And then the Ministry of Social Development and Human Security will be expected to report uh, what it received and make findings and recommendations for any changes that should be made to the law. And then it will be up to the cabinet to decide next steps. Uh, it's worth noting that the government is not required to make any changes as a result of the consultation process. Uh, most observers have noted that this draft law is being treated as a priority matter by the government. So it is expected that the draft will probably be introduced into the parliament sometime mid-year 2022. 
So what this means is all the issues, concerns, and arguments that you will hear tonight are part of a process that most people uh, believe it will move rather quickly. And finally, I think also, since the draft law will affect all nonprofit groups operating in Thailand, regardless of what existing law they may be registered under, it is likely that the concerned audience will grow as more and more people and groups recognize that their daily operations will be affected by this law. The draft also deals with dis issues of funding from foreign sources, further expanding the concerned audience. There's already a lot of interest in this law from Bangkok-based diplomats, UN agencies, increasingly business and social clubs, including the one that you're sitting in tonight. So I expect that tonight will be just the beginning of a longer conversation about this law during the year. So that, with that, I'm going to introduce my guests, our guests. Um, our first guest uh, to speak will be uh, Dr. Vitit Muntabon. Uh, Dr. Vitit actually hardly needs an introduction, but I'll give one anyways. <laughs> um, Dr. Vitit was the UN Special Rapporteur on the Sale of Children. He is an international law professor and educated in the United Kingdom, obtaining his law degree at Oxford. He also holds a degree on European law from the Free University of Brussels. Uh, he is currently a professor of law at Chula Longkorn University in Bangkok. He teaches international law, human rights, migration, refugee law, child rights, and international humanitarian law. He was awarded the UNES UNESCO Human Rights Education Prize in 2004. And he served on so many UN nations, UN bodies, uh, that it's hard to keep count. But uh, right now, he is currently the Special Rapporteur on, the, on Human Rights in Cambodia. Uh, he previously served uh, as the Chair of the International Commission of Inquiry on the Ivory Coast. Uh, he served as a Commissioner on the Independent International Commission of Inquiry on Syria. Uh, he has also served uh, as the Special Rapporteur uh, for North Korea. So uh, he does a substantial amount of work here in Thailand and around the world, and we're very lucky to have him tonight. So, Ajahn Viti. Good evening, Swati Krap. Dear friends, uh, first of all, Happy New Year and uh, forthcoming Happy Chinese New Year. Um, I've been asked to present in the English language, uh, but I would emphasize that it's very important to relay the messaging from this panel to the Thai media. So please do your best, not just to be internationalized, but it must be localized. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here with that humble message. Um, the first sort of reflection is, uh, are we really talking about NGOs and non-profit organizations, or are we s sort of reflecting on something a bit larger that is um, a penumbra that shades or covers all of us in a very personal sense? Actually, the starting point, which affects the FCCT and everybody here, is that we're actually talking about freedom of association, freedom of peaceful assembly and freedom of expression at the same time. So I would urge us very humbly to start there. Uh, and when people come together, whatever the shape and form, they are manifesting uh, their particular right, which is a universal right or various rights, also guaranteed in the local laws and policies to some extent. So the crunch is, when there's a test case which affects the FCT, which affects the embassies in terms of your clubs, which affects the, all the little groups and groupings in Thailand, we are actually testing the limits of what we guarantee as basic rights. And the understanding must be that those rights can be subject to some limitations, but it is the authorities which must prove that those limitations, as invoked by them, are justified and justifiable. And really, that's the sort of crunch of what the discussion's about, rather than jumping into the organization, including FCCT or your clubs at the embassies. So the 
the response to that initial reflection is, we do accept that freedom of expression and assembly and association can be constrained by national security, by public order, by public health, by public morality. Those are the four maximum ones. But the state must prove that it is doing something legal. It must prove that it's not arbitrary, not just discretionary. So that's the principle of legality. The state, to invoke national security plus, must prove that it's necessary to limit those rights, the principle of necessity. And the state must prove that what it's doing is proportionate to the claimed risks the principle of proportionality. And if we start there, I think uh, there's a very interesting, very quick answer to all this, and that is the current draft law, which is, yes, it's about NPPA, NPO, about NGO, it doesn't respond, it doesn't satisfy those tests in terms of abiding by those rights and freedoms and fulfilling the parameters if the state wants to constrain those rights and freedoms in accordance with legality, proportionality, and necessity. So that's a, a little chapeau to start off with before we get into all the details. Secondly, secondly, what is the preferred position internationally if we are to cover non-profit organizations and NGOs, including FCCT maybe, or the clubs in your embassies or the chambers of commerce? If you look through UN literature, the response is, well, the sort of law and policy we should be going for is the law and policy that invites notification, if you want, from the organization, an NGO, FCC, but with a view to incentivization, perhaps tax incentives, rather than surveillance and control and manipulation. Because the state has so many other tools for those latter three considerations, surveillance, control, and manipulation already, particularly if it's a, not a very democratic state or semi-democratic state or semi-non-democratic state. So that's the other caveat that we have to start with. So um, is it the sort of law that we're going to see, uh, what we have as a draft? And my friends and I humbly will discuss the details in a moment, but let's see the general panorama a little bit. And thirdly, when people group up as human rights defenders, including NGOs, and seek some support in terms of solidarity, including funding. I mean, we do have an international position on this, and there was, in 1998, a universal declaration on the rights of human rights defenders, including a specification that people, when they group up, should also have right of access to support from outside as well, in terms of resources, as a basic principle to be respected, rather than just being blocked initially. So the state, if it wants to constrain that again, must prove that it's really necessary and proportionate and legal. So those are three initial considerations before we jump into the, the nitty gritty of the substance. And I won't go too much into the substance because you have other, we have other colleagues um, coming to the substance. But let me say this anyway. Uh, number one, um, the country already has too many laws. <laughs> There's a fixation on over-legislation, and particularly laws on national security. So you should never trust any laws that have the words national security plus. And this infamous, famous law has so many provisioning, or much provisioning, or provisions, uh, even on um, impinging on the well-being of others, etc. But national security laws are ubiquitous omnipotent, unnecessary, particularly in non-democratic states. And you have a flurry of them here. Famously, whatever is conditioning us now, humbly, modulated by me, uh, including the national security-related emergency decree, that also impinges upon uh, all the gatherings that we're talking about. So over-legislation already. Secondly, um, if the claim is to have more coverage of anti-money laundering, or more transparency from NGOs and so on. There are ways of doing that already. The anti-money laundering decrees, 
the, the laws, the regulations can also be extended to individuals and others linked with NGOs and non-profit organizations already. And thirdly, interestingly, if you look at the Constitution, which bears on this, and uh, the Constitution is a product of a coup d'etat, it actually has some provisions which are not so bad. And the one on freedom of association is a very interesting one. Article or section 42 says that everybody has the right to freedom of association. And it specifies very categorically what the exceptions could be, including national security or prevention of uh, distortion of competition in economic terms. But it does not include, it does not include various terms such as the well-being of others. It does not include elements such as, oh, disruption of society or social fragmentation, which are very broad terms subject to very untraveled discretion of the authorities, which actually appear in the text that we will talk about now. So even in accordance with the Constitution, we are a bit apprehensive from the start before we jump into the text itself of the law that we're talking about. Now, as I come to the text of the draft law, first of all, um, there is a consideration as to whether it's necessary at all. And that is to be tested in accordance with section 77 of the Constitution directly. It says, section 77 says, you, sh you must prove that it's necessary to have a law. <laughs> and then you should go for a public hearing as well. So this is a phase now of testing whether we need a public hearing. But the response also must satisfy the question, is it necessary at all, subject to what I've said already. So that's a number one consideration. Secondly, um, it pertains, this draft law pertains to non-profit organizations. And there's a definition. There's a definition. Non-profit organization is defined in the early part of the draft text as grouping of people who come together to undertake activities for non-profit purposes, excluding those who come together, groupings for profit, presumably companies, huh? and excluding political parties. But the actual definition itself is incredibly broad. I mean, anybody who comes together for a non-profit purpose. And who decides? Well, who decides? Well, the person who's responsible, or, or the authorities who's responsible for the, uh, the law itself, which is a, a ministry. Uh, previously, in the early draft, Ministry of Interior, now shifted to the Ministry of Social Development. And uh, they will have a lot of power in terms of untrammeled interpretation of that initial consideration. Secondly, when you get to, there are basically two parts. Part two, or oh, part one, sorry, you have this, the introduction. Then part one is about setting up this committee to look after all this. And the name of the committee is the Committee to Promote and Develop Non-Profit Organizations. Very lovely term, you know, promote and um, develop or whatever. And then towards the end of this section, it says, OK, the committee can also provide incentives such as tax incentives, which doesn't sound that bad in terms of this first section or the first part of the law. But when you jump to the second part, you'll see what happens. It's the reverse. It's not about. Um, incentives at all, but it's about control and surveillance and p potentially um, super supervision of NGOs and the like. So um, as a second consideration in terms of the draft itself, are we sort of contradicting it ourselves or the law itself, contradicting itself by saying in part one, we're here to promote and develop, and then you get to the second part, which is control, supervision, and ultimately sanction. I believe there could be a travesty emerging somehow. Thirdly, the big problem is part two of the draft law. And this is the one that interacts with operationalization of NGOs and NPOs and the like. Section 19 obliges nonprofit organizations, and particularly NGOs, to report its activities to this registrar who's linked with the ministry concerned. The registrar's gonna have a lot of work, you know. 
Um, but he or she or they are going to have to check things like national security and so on. And do you really believe that one registrar is going to do this alone, particularly to check on national security issues? I think, as the lawyers would say, race ipsa loquitur, the thing speaks for itself. There will be others behind the registrar checking in terms of ambivalence of tentacles behind helping possibly those who are checking us. Fourthly, the very incisive and important and also challenging section is section 20, which says that if NGOs are against, uh, undertake activities against uh, uh, national security, lead to social disruption, affect economy, affect the well-being of others. All these can lead to accountability of the NGO as well as stoppage of its operations, and then it leads to various sanctions. But this section is a very big problem because it has all these provisions which go far beyond any laws uh, that allow provisioning to control and supervise. Uh, we don't have a law generally that says you can't undertake activities which uh, might lead to social disruption, but this law says it. Or we don't have a law generally which says you can't do something which affects the well-being of others. This law has it. But when we have laws which are permissible, they tend to be to do with national security, public order, public health, and public morality. But this law goes far beyond in section 20. And then uh, finally, uh, you have these um, other provisions which call for accountability. So if the NGO or, or the nonprofit organization doesn't report fully, uh, then sanctions can be lodged against them. Uh, so um, particular concern in terms of reporting on money coming from foreign sources. Mm. And that pertains very much to section 21 and 22. And if you don't report properly, you, you can be stopped in terms of your operations with all kinds of um, sanctions following. Now, last but not least, I'll just round off because our, our other friends will give you the details. Um, the sanctions are very severe uh, for not reporting and uh, not complying with the registrar's order. Uh, the sanctions are uh, up to 50,000 baht fine together with uh, 1,000 baht per day for delayed uh, compliance. Secondly, the sanction is very exorbitant in regard to um, where the NPO or the NGO disrupts social order or affects the well-being of others or affects national security. It's up to 500,000 baht fine uh, together with 10,000 baht a day for delayed compliance. And it is a double dosage. It's, it's copying from COVID, you know? Mm. It's double dosage. Why? Because not only is the NGO or NPO responsible and liable, the manager is also responsible and liable to the same amount. So you just multiply it by two. So FCCT, um, we love you, but the manager of FCC can also be on his or her or their toes, please. <laughs> as well as all the clubs affecting or affected by this uh, attached embassies and the like, and maybe the cham chambers of commerce. So there are international relations issues uh, pertaining to all this. So last but not least, let me say this. Well, what next? Now it's going to go to parliament. Uh, two or three possible actions. Um, of course, they have to comply with um, section 77, which is to have public hearings. But I'm questioning that because the provision before public hearings is to, to, to ask whether you need it at all, whether it's necessary. And I think the debate is that at least I'm claiming you don't need it because there's over legislation already. Plus, this draft law is not complying with both international law and even national law. Secondly, uh, let's work well with political parties. Thirdly, work well with NGOs and others to have a good presence and good good government people who see the light of it. And um, ultimately, the sort of law that we would very much like is a law that goes along with the international flow. Notification with incentives, rather than supervision, control, manipulation, <clears throat> whatever. Uh, and we have all the laws for the latter three anyway. So uh, let's encourage good leaders in our country to see the light of the day a bit 
Don't copy COVID, please, with double dosage. Let's transcend all that and show that with political will, well, there's a will, there's a way. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ajahn Vitit. Uh, very, very informative. Next, we're going to hear from Kun uh, Sayamon Kayurawong. She is a commissioner of the National Human Rights Commission of Thailand, uh, one of the seven commissioners there. Uh, she has a Master of Law uh, from Chula Longkorn University, also uh, a Bachelor of Law from Chula. Uh, she, has, uh, she was the advisor on legal affairs for the Office of the Ombudsman. Uh, she served as Deputy Secretary General and then Acting Secretary General of the Law Reform Commission. Uh, she has uh, also been a member of the Independent Commission on Environment and Health, uh, the Director of the Center for e Ecological Awareness Building, held a number of senior positions uh, uh, for the NGO, the Foundation for Ecological Recovery, and also was uh, attorney of law and then the chief of the Legal Aid Center for the Union of Civil Liberty. So uh, Kun Sayamon is going to speak to us in Thai. Uh, Kun Panu is going to translate, but we're going to allow her to uh, finish her remarks and then we'll have a summary of that. So for those of you who don't speak Thai, bear with us, but all the information will come out. And I would also point out that um, Kun Sayamon has brought a press release from the National Human Rights Commission of Thailand that outlines their position about this draft law. Uh, if you don't have a copy of that, find me afterwards. We can get you a copy. But it also explains very clearly what they think. So, Kun uh, Sayamon, over to you. สวัสดีค่ะค่ะสวัสดีค่ะเอ่อทําไมทําไมกรรมการสิทธิมนุษยชนแห่งชาติถึงได้มาทําความเห็นข้อเสนอเกี่ยวกับร่างกฎหมาย
แล้วก็ทํางานเป็นเครือข่ายกับกรรมการสิทธิ์ก็จํานวนมากจะแปลก่อนไหมคะก็ได้ครับท่าน so yeah uh, so basically the commission has, the commission has said that you know uh, the national human rights commission have the mandate to examine law Uh, that and, and also especially give recommendation for amendment if it breaches human rights. So uh, she's uh, mentioned that uh, they have reviewed the draft law uh, when it was developed uh, uh, through the social uh, to the uh, Ministry of Social De uh, Human Development, and also they've been seeking comments from various stakeholders, including foreign embassies, uh, international and local NGOs, uh, and state agencies, and overall. A majority of the state agency that they've seek comments have mostly agreed with the draft law because uh, they feel that there's no law in regulating uh, NGOs uh, and uh, NPOs in general at this stage. While other groups that have um, uh, give comments that most uh, don't believe don't don't believe in the draft law, saying that uh, it has element that breaches rights that is enshrined in the Thai Constitution. Um, overall, in Thailand, there are about more than 200,000 NPOs. You know, 30,000 uh, linked to development, 200,000 linked to uh, different various section of people's organization, uh, uh, and they play an important role as stakeholders in developing the country. We have learned that the National Human Rights Commission has a checklist, which has a new law in Thailand that is related to the issue, and there is a new law in Thailand. อย่างยกตัวอย่างเช่นองค์กรภาคประชาชนเนี่ยที่รวมกลุ่มแบบสภาองค์กรชุมชนก็จะมีกฎหมายของสภาองค์กรชุมชนองค์กรที่ธุรกิจที่ทำเขาเรียกว่าเป็น CSO ก็คือช่วยเหลือสังคมจดทะเบียนเป็นวิสาหกิจเพื่อสังคมก็จะมีกฎหมายส่งเสริมวิสาหกิจเพื่อสังคมในการจดแจ้งมีองค์กรที่ทําเรื่องสิ่งแวดล้อมก็จะมีกฎหมายส่งเสริมคุณภาพสิ่งแวดล้อมไปจดแจ้งกับกรมส่งเสริมคุณภาพสิ่งแวดล้อมมีองค์กรที่ทำกลุ่มของชุมชนนะคะซึ่งรวมกลุ่มในการช่วยเหลือเกี่ยวกับเรื่องชายฝั่งทะเลก็จะมีกฎหมายเ,เกี่ยวกับการส่งเสริมชายฝั่งทะเลแล้วก็ยังมีองค์กรเกี่ยวกับการพัฒนาเด็กเยาวชนคือประเทศไทยเนี่ยจะมีจำนวนกฎหมายเนี่ยมากเหมือนที่อาจารย์วิทิตเล่านะคะและแต่ละกฎหมายเนี่ยก็จะมีลักษณะที่จะให้ทั้งองค์กรภาคสังคมองค์กรธุรกิจเพื่อสังคมองค์กรแบบกลุ่มประชาชนไปจดแจ้งซึ่งกฎหมายเหล่านี้เราสามารถที่จะตรวจสอบได้เลยว่าองค์กรเหล่านี้มีการจดแจ้งอย่างไรและองค์กรที่ให้เงินทุนในประเทศไทยเนี่ยก็จะมีการรายงานทางการเงินและงบประมาณแล้วก็สามารถที่จะเช็คเข้าไปดูทั้งเว็บไซต์ทั้งตัวรายงานประชุมประจำปีเราศึกษากฎหมายเหล่านี้ทั้งหมดในประเทศไทยก็คิดว่าค่อนข้างมีจํานวนมากแล้วสามารถที่จะตรวจสอบการรายงานทางการเงินได้ทั้งองค์กรที่เป็นนิติบุคคลและองค์กรที่ไม่เป็นนิติบุคคลก็สามารถตรวจสอบได้รวมทั้งแหล่งทุนต่างประเทศที่สถานทูตให้งบประมาณหรือแหล่งทุนต่างประเทศที่องค์กร NGO ระหว่างประเทศให้เงินก็สามารถตรวจสอบงบประมาณได้ถ้ารัฐบาลกังวลในเรื่องนี้ค่ะ um, and you know uh, we have examined various you know uh, Uh, CSO and NGOs uh, uh, the, the different ways of registering. So, for example, community organization. There's a separate law for their registration. Uh, those uh, non-profit organization linked to businesses have another different law. Environment development have another law, as well as coastal development. That those that work along coastal lines have a different law to register. So, uh, as John Witt said, there are many laws in Thailand, and through them we can already examine the nature. Of uh, these organizations and how they're registered, uh, we have studied these law at the commission, and 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 we see that it's already have a lot of elements that you can verify uh, whoever registered. You can already also examine their source of funding, including uh, foreign source of funding. Yeah. If the government is concerned about the money and is concerned that NGO is going to take the money and try to make a mistake in the law of the money or the ban. หรือยาเสพติดหรือแม้แต่ในเรื่องของค่ามนุษย์นะคะเราก็ไปศึกษากฎหมายด้วยเหมือนกันพระราชบัญญัติป้องกันและปราบปรามยาเสพติดเนี่ยก็ให้อำนาจแก่เจ้าพนักง,งานที่จะยื่นต่อศาลในการตรวจสอบได้พระราชบัญญัติป้องกันและปราบปรามการฟอกเงินก็สามารถให้เจ้าหน้าที่ยื่นต่อศาลแพ่งในการตรวจสอบได้รวมทั้งพระราชบัญญัติสอบสวนคดีพิเศษหรือการค้ามนุษย์หรือแม้แต่ความผิดคอมพิวเตอร์กฎหมายเหล่านี้สามารถตรวจสอบ NGO ถ้าถ้ามีการกระทําอันที่เป็นความมั่นคงของรัฐหรือแม้แต่ก
รณีของเรามีพระราชกรรมนัดฉุกเฉินหรือกฎอายการศึกในกรณี3จังหวัดชายแดนใต้รัฐบาลก็ล้วนใช้กฎหมายเหล่านี้ในการตรวจสอบของกลุ่มประชาชนหรือ NGO ที่ดําเนินการที่มีผลกระทบต่อเขาเรียกว่าความมั่นคงของรัฐที่รัฐบาลค่อนข้างกังวลคือโดยส่วนตัวแล้วกรรมการสิทธิ์เห็นว่าจากการศึกษากฎหมายเหล่านี้เนี่ยล้วนแล้วแต่มีที่ข้อห่วงกังวลที่รัฐบาลห่วงกังวลเนี่ยสามารถใช้กฎหมายต่างๆเหล่านี้สามารถตรวจสอบทั้งเส้นทางการการฟอกเงินทั้งในเรื่องของการกระทําที่ไม่ชอบด้วยกฎหมายนะคะสิ่งนี้เองที่กรรมการสิทธิ์จึงมีข้อเสนอว่าถ้าจะมีกฎหมายเกี่ยวกับ NGO เนี่ยถ้าเราคิดว่าในการช่วยเหลือประเทศหรือการพัฒนาสังคมเนี่ยภาครัฐมีข้อจํากัดมากโดยเฉพาะกลุ่มเปราะบางที่เป็นกลุ่มชาติพันธุ์เด็กสตรีหรือคนพิการหรือแม้แต่บุคคลหลายๆทางเพศเนี่ยหน่วยงานรัฐหรือแม้แต่กรณีเรื่องจัดการเรื่องโควิดเนี่ยนะคะการดําเนินการที่ค่อนข้างเข้าถึงเร็วเนี่ยและสามารถช่วยเหลือทั้งฟื้นฟูทั้งเรื่องการส่งต่อของผู้ที่ได้รับผลกระทบนะคะก็ล้วนแล้วแต่เป็นบทบาทขององค์กรภาคสังคมที่ดําเนินการได้อย่างมีประสิทธิภาพกสมได้เสนอต่อรัฐบาลว่าในกรณีของโควิดเนี่ยรัฐบาลควรให้คำความสำคัญกับการส่งเสริมองค์กรภาคสังคมในการช่วยการส่งต่อคนที่ป่วยเป็นโควิดและส่งต่อไปยังโรงพยาบาลแต่เรื่องนี้รัฐบาลก็ไม่ได้นำข้อเสนอที่กสมไปดำเนินการนะคะแต่ใช้เวทีตั้งสอสอบคก็คือตั้งหน่วยงานระดับจังหวัดในการช่วยเหลือ If the government is worried about sort of things like money laundering, human trafficking, or narcotics, uh, officially there's already existing laws that um, officials can go to the court of these laws uh, and and examine NGOs. Uh, there's already mechanism for all these things. Even in the case of the Deep South, where there's an emergency decree, uh, officials also can use the existing law to examine the works and the funding of NGOs. So from our study at the commission. We, uh, you know, basically we concluded we can already examine the money sourcing and uh, you know the operation of these NGOs. So if there is to be a law on NGO, uh, I think the main challenge is within the state agencies themselves in addressing a uh, problem of uh, vulnerable groups, uh, diversity, LGBTQ, disabled rights, etc. So even through this COVID pandemic, uh, we, uh, the Commission, Human Rights Commission. Uh, have advised government to support community groups in working, you know, to relieve COVID. But the government has instead choose to form uh, a, a COVID task force uh, in the different provinces instead. ตัวอย่างเช่นในกรณีที่เป็นเกี่ยวกับการละเมิดสิทธิ์ทั้งในเรื่องของการค้ามนุษย์นะคะหรือหรือแม้แต่เรื่องกรณีผู้ลี้ภัยหรือผู้หนีภัยจากเมียนมาก็ล้วนแล้วแต่กสมเนี่ยได้เครือข่ายขององค์กรสิทธิมนุษยในการให้ข้อมูลแล้วก็ส่งต่อให้ทางกสมในการเข้าไปตรวจสอบการละเมิดสิทธิ์หรือแม้แต่ในกรณีของ3จังหวัดชายแดนภาคใต้เมื่อมีการถูกซ้อมทรมานเราก็ต้องให้ก็ได้รับข้อมูลนี้จากองค์กรภาคสังคมแล้วก็ศูนย์เครือข่ายทนายความในการช่วยเหลือการคุ้มครองสิทธิ์ซึ่งเรื่องราวทั้งหมดนี้กสมก็ได้ทําความเห็นให้รัฐบาลเห็นว่าบทบาทขององค์กรประชาสังคมหรือกลุ่มพลังประชาชนเนี่ยเป็นบทบาทที่สําคัญในการขับเคลื่อนในการเป็นหุ้นส่วนการพัฒนานะคะแล้วก็สามารถคุ้มครองสิทธิ์ได้อย่างมีประสิทธิภาพและประสิทธิผลกสมจึงได้มีเสนอว่าถ้าจะมีกฎหมายเนี่ยควรจะเน้นการส่งเสริมให้เกิดการลงกลุ่มซึ่งก็เป็นไปตามรัฐธรรมนูญอยู่แล้วที่รัฐธรรมนูญรับรองสิทธิ์อันนี้ไว้แล้วก็รวมถึงเหตุผลที่เรียกว่าถ้ารัฐบาลมีความกังวลในเรื่องของการจํากัดสิทธิเสรีภาพนั้นเนี่ยมันมีกฎหมายอื่นที่สามารถดําเนินการการได้สิ่งหนึ่งที่รัฐสิ่งที่หนึ่งก็คือเวลารัฐบาลพิจารณากฎหมายเนี่ยถ้าเป็นภาคธุรกิจรัฐบาลค่อนข้างจะให้ความสําคัญที่จะลดขั้นตอนการออกใบอนุญาตเกี่ยวกับภาคธุรกิจองค์กรภาคสังคมก็เพ่นเช่นเดียวกันนะคะเพราะว่าเขาก็มีบทบาทในการที่จะทําให้การแก้ปัญหาสังคมเนี่ยช่วยพัฒนาประเทศให้เกิดความมั่นคงของมนุษย์เพราะฉะนั้นเนี่ยก็ควรจะใช้หลักแนวคิดเดียวกันในการที่จะส่งเสริมส่งเสริมก็คือหมายความว่าองค์กรภาคสังคมเนี่ยต้องหาเงินทุนด้วยตัวเองนะคะรัฐบาลไม่ได้ไปอุดหนุนเขาเลยแต่ที่ผ่านมาเนี่ยภาระทั้งหลายเนี่ยเราค่อนข้างให้ประชาชนและภาคสังคมเนี่ยรับภาระไปทั้งหมดถ้าหากเป็นไปตามรัฐธรรมนูญที่จะลดภาระประชาชนแล้วเนี่ยเราควรจะส่งเสริมแล้วก็มีข้อยกเว้นเรื่องภาษีหรือแม้แต่เรื่องการการส่งเสริมคือยกเว้นภาษีแล้วก็การให้เงินอุดหนุนตรงส่วนนี้จะมีความสําคัญแล้วก็ภาคสังคมจะช่วยรัฐในการพัฒนาประเทศได้ได้อย่างมีประสิทธิภาพอ
พราะฉะนั้นถ้าถ้าแนวคิดเป็นการส่งเสริมเนี่ยกฎเกณฑ์ก็ไม่ควรจะเป็นกฎเกณฑ์ของการควบคุมถ้าจะมีการจดแจ้งก็จดแจ้งเพื่อที่ว่ารัฐจะไปส่งเสริมก็สามารถจะตรวจสอบอันนี้ได้แล้วก็ที่สําคัญก็คือว่าการควบคุมกํากับดูแลเนี่ยรัฐบาลจําเป็นจะต้องมาเขาเรียกว่าแบ่งกลุ่มเพราะว่าองค์กรประชาสังคมหรือกลุ่มพลังประชาชนมันมีความหลากหลายมากและแต่ละองค์กรมีวัตถุประสงค์ที่แตกต่างกันรัฐบาลควรจะจําแนกกลุ่มถ้ารัฐบาลคิดว่ากลุ่มนั้นเป็นกลุ่มที่มีเขาเรียกว่ามีผลต่อความมั่นคงรัฐบาลก็เลือกไปไปเขาเรียกว่าเลือกไปควบคุมแต่ไม่ควรจะใช้การจัดทํากฎหมายแบบครอบคลุมแล้วก็ควบคุมทั้งหมดซึ่งมันก็จะทําให้เกิดปัญหาความขัดแย้งแล้วก็นําไปสู่การละเมิดสิทธิ์กสมก็ต้องมาตรวจสอบการละเมิดสิทธิ์เพิ่มมากขึ้นอีกนะคะงั้นนี้ก่อน So in in overall, you know, in our work, when we examine uh, uh, rights uh, abuse in human trafficking, or in, in cases where you know there are cases with uh, people from Burma fleeing to Thailand, or even cases uh, cases of torture, alleged tortures in the Deep South, you know, these things are brought to our attention through the work of CSOs and NGOs uh, or these organizations. So in, uh, from from our point of view, they are important stakeholders and partner in sort of you know uh, helping Thailand. Uh, so, if there is to be an NGO law, it should rather support the freedom of assembly of these uh, non-profit organisations. And if the government is so concerned, uh, you know, uh, with, 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 with problems that it can arise, there are already other laws that can cover. In business-related law laws, the government tend to cut red tapes to help business growth. Why can't we have the same approach for a social organisation that should be support and enshrine? Uh, Uh, instead, right now, you know, uh, people organization and social organization have to bear a lot of responsibility. Uh, instead, they should be supported because they are important stakeholders in developing this country. Uh, this not, this, if there is going to be a law, it should not be about control. It should be about assisting uh, CSO and, and, and nonprofit organization. And in. And if they do want to manage, another important point that she makes is that mm. they should, the government should then separate it, the categories of NPOs, because at the moment, it's so the, the the definition is very wide, so they can uh, the separate the different categories and only address the small, uh, you know, one category if there is, is any that affect national security. But then, even they do that, they should be careful, and the law should not be sort of. Asserting too much control, otherwise our work we will have to also go in and and look at rights abuses, uh, you know, under our mandate. Yeah, and this, the view to the law of the Congress of the Union that passed through the Senate during the last year, the view that was in the process of the Congress of the Union was that the law of the Congress of the Union was that the law of the Congress of the Union คือการยกล่างที่ปรับปรุงใหม่ขึ้นเนี่ยเดิมทีเนี่ยเปลี่ยนจากกระทรวงมหาดไทยมาเป็นกระทรวงพัฒนาสังคมในการทําหน้าที่ส่งเสริมแต่ว่าคํานิยามขององค์กรไม่สแสวงหากําไรเนี่ยก็ยังค่อนข้างมีคํานิยามที่ที่กว้างแล้วก็มีแนวโน้มที่จะมีผลต่อการเลือกปฏิบัติคือแน่นอนองค์กรที่มีการจดทะเบียนเป็นสมาคมหรือมูลนิธิที่เป็นนิติบุคคลเนี่ยเขาต้องจดทะเบียนกับกระทรวงมหาดไทยตามประมวลกฎหมายแพ่งอันนี้มันตรวจสอบได้แต่โดยในยะหนึ่งก็คือองค์กรที่รวมกลุ่มแบบขนาดเล็กซึ่งกลุ่มต่างๆเหล่านี้เราจะพบว่าการรวมกลุ่มเนี่ยล้วนแล้วแต่เป็นคนหนุ่มสาวที่ที่ต้องการที่จะทํางานภาคสังคมเนี่ยเขาก็จะมีวัฒนธรรมในการทํางานเป็นกลุ่มเล็กๆแล้วก็ค่อนข้างมีผลสะเทือนต่อการแก้ไขปัญหาเนี่ยมันก็จะทําให้มีผลต่อการใช้กฎหมายเนี่ยไปเลือกปฏิบัติที่จะควบคุมซึ่งอันนี้เราจําเป็นจะต้องถ้าเราจะมีกฎหมายเนี่ยเราควรจะให้องค์กรภาคประชาสังคมตรวจสอบกันเองนะคะเป็นในยะที่เขาตรวจสอบกันเองเขาดําเนินการเองเพราะเขาหาเงินเองอะรัฐบาลเนี่ยควรจะทําหน้าที่แค่สนับสนุนส่งเสริมไม่ต้องเข้าเข้ามาควบคุมจัดการอีกประเด็นหนึ่งที่เป็นประเด็นสําคัญพอกฎหมายมีในยะอย่างนั้นเนี่ยมันจึงยังมีมาตรการในการควบคุมคือร่างกฎหมายเนี่ยมีสองนัยยะคือส่งเสริมในการยกเว้นภาษีแต่อีกนัยยะหนึ่งก็มีการควบคุมถ้ามีการดําเนินการที่เรียกว่าจดแจ้งและพบว่าการดําเนินการขององค์กรนั้นเนี่ยอาจจะไม่ถูกกฎหมายก็สามารถเพิกถอนได้ทันทีและที่สําคัญคือมีบทลงโทษทางอาญานะคะที่นายทะเบียนเนี่ยสามารถที่จะเพิกถอนองค์กรนั้นได้แล้วก็ยุติในการดําเนินการได้คือโทษทางอาญาเนี่ยถ้าตามรัฐธรรมนูญมาตรา77เนี่ยให้ความสําคัญกับหลักการคือกฎหมายควรจะมีเท่าที่จําเป็นและก็ไม่ควรกําหนดโทษทางอาญาเพราะว่าจะทําให้เราเนี่ยมี
ผู้ต้องขังเนี่ยอยู่ในคุกมากด้วยมันมีผลในยะสําคัญและนี่ก็เป็นนโยบายที่ทั้งรัฐบาลแล้วก็ตัวกสมเองเห็นว่ากฎหมายและประเภทเราควรจะไม่มีโทษทางอาญาได้แล้วเพื่อลดการดีผู้ต้องขังในเรือนจําที่มีปัญหาจํานวนมากซึ่งกฎหมายลักษณะแบบนี้ไม่ควรมีโดยเฉพาะกฎหมายที่มาควบคุมคนกลุ่มบทบาทที่มีบทบาทต่อการพัฒนาประเทศอันนี้จําเป็นจะต้องพิจารณาใหม่ต่อร่างกฎหมายที่ผ่านคอรมอซึ่งถ้าเรามีคิดถ้าถ้ามุมมองของรัฐบาลว่าเขามีบทบาทในสังคมเนี่ยเราก็จะมีแนวคิดบื่นที่เราส่งเสริมภาคธุรกิจในการดําเนินการประกอบกิจการถ้าเราลองกลับมาคิดใหม่เราก็จะได้คนที่ช่วยพัฒนาประเทศมากกว่าที่เราจะควบคุมเพราะถ้าเราควบคุมเราเหมือนจะกำลังผลักดันให้องค์กรภาคสังคมไปอยู่คู่ตรงข้ามกับรัฐบาลมันก็จะทําให้ประเทศไทยเนี่ยมีความขัดแย้งยิ่งมากขึ้นไปทุกทีและทําให้กสมเนี่ยซึ่งเป็นคนที่จะต้องรับฟังความเห็นทั้งสองฝ่ายทั้งรัฐบาลแล้วก็ทั้งภาคประชาชนที่ร้องเรียนเข้ามาเนี่ยทำให้เราเนี่ยจำเป็นจะต้องพูดบนหลักการที่เรียกว่าทั้งรัฐธรรมนูญทั้งหลักการคุ้มครองสิทธิตามกติการะหว่างประเทศและหลายครั้งเราก็คุยกับหน่วยงานของรัฐว่าหลักการที่สําคัญเนี่ยรัฐบาลจะต้องให้ความสําคัญกับการคุ้มครองสิทธิเพราะฉะนั้นรัฐบาลควรจะให้ความสําคัญกับประชาชนที่เขาจะมีบทบาทแล้วก็คนหนุ่มสาวที่เขาจะต้องเติบโตมาเป็นคนกําลังสําคัญของประเทศที่เขาควรจะใช้พลังของเขาในการพัฒนาประเทศในฐานะที่เขารวมกลุ่มกันที่มีหลากหลายค่ะขอบคุณค่ะ So from the draft that passed the Council of State earlier this year, you know, uh, that changes the ministry responsible from the Interior to the Social Development Ministry. The definition of NPO is still very broad. Um, NPO is already, uh, you know, already registered with Ministry of Interior and already examinable. Like you can actually go in and see uh, who they are and whatnot. Uh, and the, the draft law is also very selective in the way that they that that, that is empowered. And you know, at the moment, you know, there's uh, NGOs and MPOs where young people, you know, they work in small groups, and this law could affect them. If there is to be any kind of law, we would recommend uh, that these social organizations uh, have some sort of uh, a mechanism to self-govern, rather than the government uh, stepping into control or interfere. Uh, the draft law, there, there are two different elements: uh, the tax incentive and also control. Um, but the problem is that the you know the way that it is drafted. Uh, the element control uh, is very severe. If, if organization are illegal, uh, their license could be revoked, and there could be increase in criminal offenses uh, to to the people involved. Now, under Article 77 of the Thai Constitution, it stipulates that uh, there should be there, there shouldn't be too many laws in Thailand. That 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 laws should be only uh, there should be only necessary ones, and that there should not be too many criminal. Uh, laws because that would increase, you know, criminalization, increase uh, uh, people that would be sentenced to jail, etc., etc. So I think to to have this under consider consideration, the government need to reassess the NPOs and see them as important partners in society and treat them like I said, what I said before, like business. You know, that that instead of uh, controlling them, we should provide them incentive to be our partners. Uh, otherwise, if you push them. And, and make them sort of enemy of the state or something that will create more problem. As human rights commissioner, we have to listen to all sides, and we recommend that the government should really listen to them. Oh, and so we have this experience. 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 So uh, we have sent our comment to the government and to uh, Deputy Prime Minister Wisnu Kruangam. And the next step for us is that you know, Deputy Prime Minister Wisnu will have to uh, will meet with us and, and we'll have to reassess all these different elements that we have recommended. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kun uh, Sayamon. Next, we're going to hear from Kun uh, Titirat. Tip Samrit Kun Nakap. She is uh, the chairperson of Amnesty International's Thailand chapter. Uh, she has a, a, a law degree from Kyoto University, an LLM from uh, SOAS in the UK, uh, an LLM from the Graduate School of International Cooperation Studies at Kobe. Uh, she teaches at uh, Thammasat uh, Law Faculty. Uh, she has numerous publications, and uh, we're very pleased to have her with us. So. Floor is yours. Thank you very much, Phil, for the uh, kind introduction. And um, 
Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for having me here, and, and it's very pleased to hear uh, the opinions of uh, both Ajahn Vitit and also Kun Seamun, uh, the commissioner, as well. And uh, Amnesty has been uh, uh, advocating for uh, the right of association and also the uh, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly uh, for so long, and I think uh, uh, people here, folks here, are uh, aware of the, our effort. I'm um, concerned that my voice might not be very clear, so I please allow me to take a uh, mask off just during uh, my speaking. So I actually have a slide, a very uh, a short one, if uh, you could please, uh, okay, yeah. So this just summarize what I'm going to, the part of things that I'm going to uh, uh, talk about uh, today. Uh, the f I will talk about the basic principles, uh, related principle, uh, which Ajahn Vitit already cover. Uh, a lot of them, I will just uh, add some more things over there. And the problems, particular problems of this law, uh, which will be overlapping with uh, Kun Seamon uh, for some point, uh, but I also have some uh, other issues to add as well. And then I, will, I would like to focus more on the impact what can be uh, negative impacts on uh, Thai civil society, the freedom of association, and also Thai society as a whole as well. So I'll focus more on uh, the impact issue. But first of all, let me uh, start with the basic principles. Of course, uh, I think we have to start uh, this issue by emphasizing on freedom. Uh, the society should have freedom. People should have freedom, just like what uh, Ajahn Vitit and also Kun Sayamon said before. And uh, I think we, we emphasize on this too little. Uh, in Thailand, many times we hear people talk about freedom. Yes, everyone has freedom, but you know, you, you, you're familiar with this phrase, right? Of course, we, we know that freedom can be restricted, uh, but those restrictions must be necessarily proportionate uh, to uh, achieve the legitimate goals. So it doesn't mean that any kind of reason would be legitimate. It must be something uh, accepted under the international law, under the constitutional law of the country, right? Um, so apart from these two principles, freedom and necessity and proportionality, I would like to emphasize more on the rule of law itself. I think everyone here is familiar with the idea of rule of law that the uh, uh, execution of law of any power must be done in a clear manner uh, that anticipated uh, in advance by law. And it's quite clear uh, for, many, for many parts of the, this draft that uh, other speakers already mentioned that there are many provisions that are not very clear in this law, right? And it open to arbitrary or arbitrary decision by the law enforcer or the abuse of law. And when I say the abuse of law, it does not only mean uh, abuse by the law, the, the officials, but it can be from private persons as well. And we call it SLAP, right? Strategic litigation against public participation. And my concern is that this law will be another tool for SLAP. And, and I think we see too many slap cases in, in this country, and uh, slap is being uh, an important issue uh, for international community, uh, for civil society. I know UN also uh, uh, encouraged some uh, research on this uh, issue in Thailand as well. Okay, uh, apart from rule of law, another two uh, principles that I think we have to look at is the principle of risk-based and right-based lawmaking. Especially when we talk about uh, the law, the legislation regarding anti-money laundering, uh, the legislation that will be very much uh, restrictive because it uh, confer a lot of uh, uh, power for uh, the officials to search or to uh, acquire report or even to order uh, the change of behaviors. And this is quite clear that it must be done uh, by assessing the risk of those activities. And as Kun Sayamon also said before, that if the government is worried about risk, then the government is accountable, must be accountable to explain what are the risks and so far, I haven't heard about the risk 
the clear risk uh, derived from the activities of NGOs. Um, some uh, agency rely on the international organization recommendation, uh, which is called uh, FATF, the uh, Financial uh, Task Force, right, uh, which regard the anti-money laundering and uh, uh, contribution, financial contribution to terrorist activities. That these international recommendation, uh, this organization uh, recommend the revision of NG NPO law or NPO regulation, so that it will not allow uh, NPO activities to be used, NPO to be used uh, as uh, uh, contributing to terrorist activity. However, it is quite clear that. FATF, F -A -T -F, uh, uh, recommendation specify that the restriction on NPO or regulation on NPO must be done on risk base, which means that the government has to identify what types of activities that are risk based. And uh, uh, if you if you look at the, the report of uh, APG, uh, the the the, uh, in the the organization that uh, uh, delivered this recommendation, it is clear that most of the civil society in th in Thailand do not propose risk on the financial contribution on terrorist activity. So I mean, this is the part that we have to ask the question, and I, I would uh, uh, encourage media here to ask the question. What are the risks being posed by NPO in this country? And then we can, we can talk about then what are the appropriate measures to restrict or to prevent or to circumvent those risks, right? So that, that is uh, one of the most important things that I would like to highlight. The other issue is about right-based lawmaking that we have to concern whether or not the measure, the measure uh, we use to restrict uh, or to uh, 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 request the transparency or to request uh, the, the NPO or civil societies uh, to do will not be, will not put too much burden in the sense that it will infringe freedom of people. Okay, so those are the, the, the principles that I would like to highlight here. Then come to, coming to the problems, uh, I uh, put number uh, behind uh, the four uh, issues on my slide so that uh, you can uh, go check uh, in details, and I think we do have some uh, translation, unofficial translation of the bill already that you can check. Uh, so uh, first of all, the true board restriction of activities that uh, many have already mentioned, that we have this broad meaning <laughs> of uh, national security, uh, the normal happiness of people, which is not defined. And is this clearly against uh, the section 77 of the constitution, which uh, uh, say that any kind of uh, decision make uh, the, the, the use of power by authority must not be done in arbitrary manner. So the rule about discretionary power must be clear. And we do not have any explanation over there. What does these uh, phrases mean? in section 20. So in itself, it is clearly against, uh, contradicted with uh, the uh, section 77, which is requirement for any law uh, in, in this country. And then another issue about the one size fits all blanket disclosure obligation uh, under section uh, uh, 19. Uh, and this one uh, clearly, uh, um, put too much burden for all kind of NPOs. It's just like uh, Kun Sayamon said, that actually we have to distinguish between different types of activities, different types of NPOs. And actually we already have some laws uh, to, to, uh, 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 to govern some disclosure uh, obligation already. Uh, and um, so it's not clear why we have to put this one side fits all blanket disclosure obligation on all kind of associations and society in this country. Okay, the third problem is about undue and unclear control on funding. The right to seek for funding is part of the freedom of association. This is clearly confirmed by Human Rights Committee, by uh, the UN 
uh, human rights defender declaration, just like what Ajahn Bhitti said before. And it is also confirmed uh, as part of the uh, obligation of Thai government. So, you know, when we talk about rights, uh, we, we, we do not only talk about rights of individual or rights of group of individual, but we also have to talk about obligation of the government as well. And the obligation does not only mean the negative part, it also has the positive obligation to facilitate the funding. But right now, this uh, section 21 and 22 is doing the contrary by restricting the access to funding. So actually, the government should uh, do more in providing incentives. And uh, there is one section, section 16, talks about the tax incentive that might be possible, period. So we only have one sentence of tax incentive. But you have the whole two uh, long provisions about uh, control on funding. So uh, I, urge, uh, I would like to urge the uh, ministry to look at this balance of controlling on one side, which should be done in a uh, uh, limited manner only for the necessary and proportionate uh, issue, and increase more encouragement uh, incentive, incentive, to incentivize more public goods or public uh, uh, the civil society activities over there. And the last issue that everyone already said is uh, the disproportionate sanctions. And it is clearly against the idea of uh, association. I'm talking about both profit and non-profit. The idea of association is to uh, make the liability limited, right? So when we talk about company, when we talk about association, and this idea is actually go against the basic idea of uh, uh, the law regarding association. And of course, uh, just like Ajahn Viti said, that uh, it's almost impossible for any uh, NGO which is not creating any profit to uh, pay the, the sanction. And then the, the impact will be clearly uh, shilling effects on funding that might come from either domestic or international because we cannot afford to pay this uh, uh, sanction, to pay uh, this uh, uh, fee, right? And so it doesn't have to wait until this law to be enforced and uh, wait for the court to deliver the decision. Even before the decision, even before going to the court, every organization, including the organization that provide funding, has to assess the risk. And these parts will be included in the risk assessment, and that will drive all the funding away from Thailand. And I'm not only talking about civil society, it can be any kind of association, any kind of public works that civil society, is uh, civil society or, or association of people in, in this country is helping the, the function of the government. And then, of course, we know that the effect of this, another effect of this is less bridge of uh, uh, the bridge between government and people. Civil societies are working as bridges for government function and people. They fill the gap, just like the, the, the example that the other speaker mentioned. During the COVID-19, they, they try so much to fill that gap. And we improve, we develop a lot of uh, uh, things in this society because of their work. So in this sense, fewer bridges between uh, government and people. And then um, at the end of the day, this, if this law is enforced in this form uh, at the current draft, I think it will bring the less relevancy of Thailand, its position in the international society, in the international community. I think the, 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 the level of being Geneva of the East, being the center of regional uh, uh, you know, civil society helping the other countries to improve will not be in Thailand anymore. Many organizations will consider moving to another country, funding, register of funding organization will move to Singapore or other countries as the rule of law can be more uh, predictable. I think it's quite clear. Uh, uh, I think if this happened to uh, commercial sphere, I think it, it would be even more clearer uh, uh, that the, this kind of limitation of freedom 
will drive everyone away from Thailand uh, in that sense. And uh, I, I don't think it is something that we, we wish to see. So um, thank you very much. And if there's anything I can uh, uh, answer, I'm happy to. Thank you, Ajahn Titira. Um, now we're going to finally hear from uh, uh, Badar Farouk, who is from uh, the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. He is the Thailand team leader at the Regional Office for Southeast Asia. Uh, Badar has his LLM in Human Rights and Criminal Justice from Aberdeen University in Scotland. Uh, and actually he started his UN career in 20, 2006, working for the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal T Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in The Hague. Uh, he's worked in Nepal uh, as a human rights officer. Uh, he was with uh, the UN Human United Nations African Union hybrid mission in Darfur. So uh, heading uh, field offices in Darfur, which is quite a challenge. And uh, since October 2018, he's been here in Bangkok uh, in his position. So Madar, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, First of all, I would like to wish everybody who is physically here or maybe uh, listening to this online a happy and healthy new year. Uh, I would uh, not go too much in detail in the uh, nitty gritty of the law. My colleagues have explained that quite a lot. Uh, what uh, I would do, I would take some broad looks over what is happening here in Thailand. Uh, probably that would be quite interesting for you also and may give you a backdrop of mm -hmm why this whole thing is uh, panning out like this. Let's uh, go back a little bit in time. Uh, if we recall in uh, mid-2014 uh, when the coup took place, we had a, a body called National Council for Peace and Order, uh, the NCPO, that was established. At that time, the freedoms, fundamental freedom, especially expression and opinion was very highly restricted. People faced military court for expression. There were detention in military barracks. Some people agreed to go into exile. And there were a multitude of attitude adjustment events that took place. Uh, in 2019, I was here when that election took place. There was hope that some change would come in. Unfortunately, those hopes were dashed. In the start of 2020, we had these youth protests starting regarding democracy. And then we saw that various laws like Public Assembly Act, the emergency decree, and some of the other laws were used, not this time expression also, but also freedom of assembly. So initially, we saw that the fundamental freedom on expression was targeted. By 2020, the freedom of assembly was also being targeted. And this was, the targeting was not so straightforward by legal persecution. Uh, there was quite a, a specific, quite a lot of use of force around the country. We have got uh, water cannons laced with the chemicals and a galore of rubber bullets flying around here and there. And the use of laissez majeste law was revived. That thing again started to work. In 2021, we can see now that we have got the NPOs Act which we are discussing today. And there is some other acts which are quite important, which was just also discussed. The draft amendment to any Man money laundering act of 1999. There are other acts like media, moral and professional standard acts. So in 2021 now, after expression and assembly, we now have freedom of association <laughs> being targeted. So uh, this whole thing tells you that the safe space required these three fundamental freedoms to be very robust and to be enjoyed and exercised. And over the time, we can see that how they are being targeted continuously. Just to give you a statistics, uh, in the last two years, in 2020 and 2021, we work quite closely with the Human Rights Council special procedures who are much easier to approach and they work very quickly. They have issued 18 communication to Thailand in those two years, 18 communication. Out of those 18, the special rapporteur on freedom of expression and opinion is involved on 12 of them. 65% that mandate is engaged. That can tell you that how important this issue is in relation to Thailand. The special rapporteur on fundamental freedom of peaceful assembly and association 
is involved on eight of them. That is nearly 45%. So these two mandates are taking a lion share of activity on Thailand in the last two years. So you can see that this thing is not just coming out of, suddenly out of thin air. There is, there is a history and a structure to it and that's why this is going on. The statistics that I have shared, they are a bit simplistic and basic and uh, they do not provide that complex analysis, but they can still indicate to you that what is happening in Thailand. Uh, I joined the regional office as mentioned in 2018 and uh, we were engaging with the special rapporteurs and they are issuing communication. The situation so got so severe in 2021 that they s resorted to a special form of communication called other letters. They have a number of different type of communication which normally becomes public after they send it to the government. They re it remains confidential for 60 days. After two months, they become uh, open. Then you can use them for advocacy. But in 2021, this resorted to another form of communication called other letters. In 48 hours, these become public. In 48 hours, these become public. So the situation become very urgent and they kept on engaging on it. Two of the other letters were NPO Act and one of the other letter was related to uh, the draft amendment on uh, Anti-Money Laundering Act and the uh, amendment on Communicable Disease Act. Unfortunately, Royal Thai government has not yet responded to any of these three that they have sent. Normally, previously, government used to engage, respond, provide explanation, but up till now, they have not done that. Another broader thing that I want to discuss is that human rights are legal rights. They are enforceable in courts. And after 2014, there is understanding that if the legal framework is tweaked down, it is diluted, the rights would be diluted. So after that, you can see that a process has started where the legal framework of Thailand is going down. Professor Vitit in his initial discussion mentioned that the constitution was created by the military. Uh, that constitution as compared to the previous constitution is weak the organic law that are coming out from that, the independent bodies, uh, we have uh, a commissioner here from NHRCT, the organic law has been diluted down. Uh, you have got a selected Senate, the independent bodies are not in control of the lower house, which is the elected house. They are in control of the Senate and they have like oversight over the lower house. Uh, this. Uh, this all tells you that the legal framework at the moment is one of the pivot, a crux of this whole thing. And these laws that are being developed, they are adding to the negativity of the legal framework. As more and more these laws are in, uh, developed, they further and further tighten the screw. The pro-democracy activists demand about reformation of the constitution is not just like that. That is one of the key issue. If the constitution and legal framework is reformed, it would help quite a lot. Uh, another thing that I would like to just mention broadly is that uh, I'm quite happy and uh, quite pleased with the advocacy effort that has taken place on this act. There has been a lot of gathering together of different organization at different layers. There has been an advocacy on this act. We have got NHRCT preparing a very good uh, letter and a very good report. Uh, we have got international media involved and this FCCT meeting is regarding that also. Uh, but, and we can also see that the law that was there in February, March 2021, this law is much more changed than that. But it still has got problematic issues which the colleagues have discussed in detail. So the advocacy work is cut out. There has to be more advocacy. We have got a bit opportunity here because the public consultation has been shifted from Council of State by the cabinet has not given it to Council of State, but to the Ministry of Social Development and Human Security. Uh, according to international standard, public consultation should involve actively, actively seeking opinion from those who are entrusted or those who are affected. At least these two parties should be actively touched upon. And this consultation must be a two-way flow of information. It should not be that affected parties or the trusted parties would provide information, they should receive something back from the ministry also that what the ministry is doing with it, uh, what is happening there. Uh, paragraph 70 of Human Rights Council Resolution 3928 obligates that the right holder 
should be able to participate in the decision making process from the early stage when all the options are open at the moment this law has been diluted down and we need to work more on it they have adopted this uh, method of public consultation which is termed as a public notice and comment method so this is a good method because it's open to everybody anybody can go there and they can provide their comment the only drawback is that people who do not have digital access they would have some challenge regarding it uh, but as professor vitit mentioned that the government may not consider all the comments that is there or all the comments that they receive this is uh, this blanket or substantial rejection of the comment is against international law and probably also against thailand's own constitution so i would just say that the advocacy should continue and we should work on it so that these issues that are there they are removed we still have time regarding this law uh, another thing that i would share which we have uh, i think there has been a little bit discussion of that is the another law that is the uh, draft amendment to the anti money laundering act of 1999 mm. that law is focused on uh, money laundering counter terrorism financing of terrorism it is not linked directly to the npo but it has got some sections uh, which with the bad faith can be used against npos also this law still retain imprisonment uh, this law still retain entering into the premises without warrant this law still retain accessing computers and digital uh, uh, devices this law still has no appeal process given the situation in southern border provinces where we have three security laws the martial law internal security act and emergency decree section 11 imposed this law would create a lot of big problem for the npos in that area so we should not be thinking about the N npos that are here in bangkok and other but we should also be thinking about the uh, the npos that are there in southern border provinces who probably would be affected by this other law also uh so i will just stop here i just wanted to talk a little bit broadly on different things yes, yes. thank you thank you very much uh four excellent presentations by the panel thank you so much to each of the panelists uh for raising these critical issues and 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 talking through them uh we have uh some time for questions from the audience uh so we do have uh for people who are here in person at the club uh there's a microphone in the back Uh I would encourage you to uh ask your question please state your name please also state your affiliation if any uh we're also looking online for people on Facebook live who are following this we have 80 or some people who are following this online if you have a question please write it in the comments section we will uh look at the comments section and we'll pick the questions out so please go ahead Hi uh my name is Paul Woodell I'm currently retired but uh in uh, nearly 50 years in Thailand I have worked for four non-profit organizations including the FCCT uh the Fulbright Foundation uh, the Keenan uh International uh, the Keenan uh, Foundation Asia and uh and the International Education uh uh Foundation uh and i just like to reinforce the comments that almost all of the panelists have made that the existing laws provide for a great deal of control over nonprofit organizations particularly if they are uh set up as foundations where to to get tax privileges you have to make a certain percentage of your income as donations um not not very well defined and like all uh nonprofit organizations you have to report annually to the ministry of the interior so my question is if the control is already there and there are many other laws that uh affect particular organizations um why are they doing this is it for <laughs> intimidation okay is it to create opportunities for corruption is it to add uh more personnel more places in the bureaucracy for people i mean what what do you see as the re the, the motivations for this 
question that goes right to the heart of the whole matter. Why? Why? <laughs> so uh, who would like to answer from the panel? Please go ahead. Please go ahead. <laughs> Well, I, I think actually, with due respect, um, again, that famous phrase from some way, you know, the thing speaks for itself, raise hips a locuter. It's a power consolidation, and it's an accumulation uh, through constraints uh, on freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, and now freedom of association. So it's a, a packaged power consolidation. And it um, means that the discretion of the authorities who didn't come through totally democratic means in terms of uh, their positioning in, in our system, uh, it, it means therefore that they are self-perpetuating in a certain way through that power consolidation. And uh, very uh, easy for them to enjoy the opportunism. Thank you. Other comments? I may add uh, on the scope of the law itself. Um, as we said that uh, many things, uh, the many restrictions or many uh, uh, regulations already exist in other laws. But there are something new in this law as well. And uh, uh, if you want to look at uh, details, it would be section 20, uh, 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 subparagraph one and two, uh, which talk about the uh, effect on national security, which include economic uh, security and uh, international related security. This is something new that we did not see in other kind of law that mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. And also uh, the, uh, the normal happiness. Uh, this one is also new. So just to add, uh, to see what, what is added here, and that might uh, also signal uh, uh, something. เอ่อที่จริงเราก็กสมก็คุยกับผู้แทนรัฐบาลนะคะเอ่อคือคิดว่ามันเกี่ยวกับโยงสังจังหวัดชายแดนภาคใต้แล้วก็หลายเรื่องที่มันมีบางส่วนที่ยังไปไม่ถึงข้อมูลบางอย่างที่เอ่อปปสํานักงานปราบปรามการฟอกเงินต้องไปตรวจสอบเอ่อสํานักงานนี้ก็เลยคิด
organization, you know, through their existing law, they don't feel that they have sufficient tool to examine uh, NPOs. So they propose uh, this law, but uh, I would argue that the government can already access uh, uh, these information. And when I applied to be a human rights commission, uh, I have the Senate uh, did ask me about sort of you know how uh, how to how to get through you know information about NPOs and and I said you know I have worked in NGOs before so the government should really support it rather. ก็ในส่วนของภาครัฐความมั่นคงเนี่ยค่อนข้างมีมุมมองว่าอย่างไรก็ต้องมีกฎหมายควบคุม NGO คันนี้พอพอภาครัฐมีมีวิธีคิดคือคือเขามีวิธีคิดแบบนั้นเนี่ยมันมันก็ยากที่ที่จะทําให้มีความไว้วางใจว่าองค์กรพัฒนาสังคมเนี่ยจะสามารถช่วยช่วยรัดช่วยรัดได้ซึ่งอันเนี้ยมันจะเป็นต้องต้องพูดคุยอีกหลายครั้งอะค่ะพูดคุยอีกหลายครั้งแล้วก็ในภาวะทางการเมืองของประเทศไทยตอนเนี้ยอยู่บนอยู่บนที่เรียกว่ามีความขัดแย้งทางการทางการเมืองสูงแล้วก็ทำให้เนี่ยการทำกฎหมายที่แก้กฎหมายครั้งที่สองเนี่ยถึงแม้ว่าดูเหมือนจะส่งเสริมแต่ก็ไม่ส่งเสริมเพราะว่าจริงๆมันมีมาตราที่เรียกว่าการดำเนินการควบคุมในเชิงการเปิดเผยข้อมูลแล้วก็มีบทลงโทษแล้วก็มีข้อห้ามหลายอย่างในลักษณะของการเขียนกฎหมายเนี่ยมันจึงเป็นไปไม่ได้เลยที่จะทําให้กฎหมายเนี่ยเป็นการส่งเสริมสนับสนุนองค์กรภาคสังคมได้เลยแล้วก็มันจะทําให้ความขัดแย้งทางการเมืองจะสูงยิ่งขึ้นที่ที่พลังของประชาชนคนไทยเนี่ยค่อนข้างมีพลังมากแล้วก็มีเครือข่ายอยู่ทั่วประเทศเนี่ยจะจะเขาเรียกว่าจะไม่เขาเรียกว่าอาจจะต้องต่อต้านรัฐบาลถึงขั้นนั้นได้ซึ่งซึ่งดิฉันคิดว่าอันนี้เราก็พยายามสื่อสารกับในส่วนของภาครัฐว่าหลายเรื่องที่มีการละเมิดสิทธิ์เนี่ยกรรมการสิทธิ์เราจะประสานงานกับหน่วยงานรัฐเลยว่าจำเป็นจะต้องแก้ปัญหานี้ก่อนก่อนที่กรรมการสิทธิ์จะทํารายงานการตรวจสอบการละเมิดสิทธิ์เพื่อให้รัฐเนี่ยหน่วยงานรัฐทั้งระดับภาคการเมืองและภาคราชการเนี่ยมีความเข้าใจว่าการแก้ปัญหาความขัดแย้งการละเมิดสิทธิ์มันไม่สามารถใช้กฎหมายได้มันต้องใช้หลักเ,เขาเรียกหลักการพูดคุย conciliation น่ยคือเราใช้พยายามกระบวนการไก่เกลี่ยให้มากที่สุดแล้วก็พยายามที่ให้ภาครัฐเข้าใจว่าหลายเรื่องปัญหาบางอย่างเนี่ยกฎหมายเมืองไทยเป็นกฎหมายที่ต้องแก้อีกหลายอย่างแล้วก็เป็นการตัวกฎหมายเนี่ยเป็นการละเมิดสิทธิ์ถ้าเรายังใช้กฎหมายอีกเนี่ยเราจะไม่สามารถที่จะคุ้มครองสิทธิ์แล้วก็ประเทศไทยก็จะไปสู่ทางตันที่เราจะหาทางออกอะไรไม่ได้เลยค่ะ um, on sort of the national security, national security side of the government um, they have this view that there must be a law to control NGOs. And this view is already breed you know, distrust towards NGO uh, instead of looking at NGOs or NPOs as uh, some, something that helps the country. Um, so there must be further talks. But the political context in Thailand right now uh, is also, you know, the country is quite polarized. So, uh, you know, the, 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 the amendment of this draft that, that are going through this process uh, some some may appear to be supportive in in sort of from the outside, but in in the way that it is written, it isn't supportive at all. For example, a uh, section that, that looks at uh, sort of uh, transparency of NPO, the way it is written, it is not support supportive at all. And I would see that it, it would even further polarize uh, Thai society. Um, NPOs that have networks around the country might even end up opposing the government openly. Uh, I think it is important for the government to realize that uh, rights abuses have to be addressed and have to be addressed through conciliation uh, uh, means, uh, ne not necessarily through laws. And you know, already many existing laws uh, have the potential to abuse and sort of you know uh, abuse people's rights. Uh, so we need to address these things. We need to talk. Uh, otherwise, you know, the commission. Our job is to go in when there, you know, when rights are abuses, and and otherwise there are going to be many more cases of rights abuses. Okay. Let me let me just add one quick thing that in section five of the existing this this new draft law, it says any NPOs which have been established by virtue of any specific law, in addition to having an act in a compliance with that law, shall also be subject to the provisions of this act. So the, the foundations that you were involved with, Paul, 
uh, which have all those various regulations from the Ministry of Interior and all the reporting, all that, are also going to have to additionally comply with the provisions of this act. So there's, this is being added on top of all the existing laws for various different registrations of various different organiz organizations in the country. Please. Hi, I'm Jennifer Gamble. I was an <clears throat> independent journalist here for 15 years. I've lived here a while. Um, well, it's so clearly an egregious uh, law and the fact that they can't even send a representative here shows how little they seem to want to care or have any desire to dialogue. So my question is really, everybody stated the gazillion ways in which it's terrible. How is there some way that you're going to get to dialogue with the government and, and find some way to, t I mean, to tell them all of this and to, and to make them understand how terrible it is for Thailand? I mean, has anybody been dialoguing with the government or has plans to or will they, will they do it? I mean, what, what can be done given how horrible we all know it is? <laughs> Yes. Um, who, would like to, who would like to take that one up? <laughs> I, also, I also have a question here from uh, Om Vichitra from uh, CRCF, who was saying um, uh, the current government, the, she said, the current government public consultation appears to be fait accompli. How do we as CSOs widen the conversation, which yeah, is yeah. also connected exactly. and similar to that, that question as well. Uh, so, uh, what do our panelists say? Uh, well, regarding, uh, I think, um, engagement with the government, uh, as I mentioned in my uh, intervention, that uh, the international mechanisms are engaged, they provide the recommendation, but these recommendations are, uh, they cannot be completely, like, they cannot be enforced on the government. These are recommendations, the government can take them up or they cannot. Uh, I will remove my mask if it is good <laughs> in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the government can uh, incorporate them, respond to them, or they cannot. Uh, beside that, uh, we have uh, our own uh, private advocacy with the government. We had meetings. We have exchange of like sending of letters, engaging and uh, sharing of international standards related to various provisions. Uh, this engagement also takes place at uh, Geneva level where our senior uh, managers engage with the permanent mission. But this is all in an advocacy basis like uh, we have uh, uh, the role of providing uh, suggestions and recommendations. These are sovereign states. So we have no further uh, sort of enforcement or that sort of thing there. Uh, and that is our role to keep on engaging, keep on recommending, keep on trying to tell them that how it is going to go. Uh, because uh, uh, United Nations and other intergovernmental bodies are created by the sovereign state themselves. So that is our position. And we engage regularly and I would reassure you that we keep on engaging. Uh, and I have mentioned in this uh, presentation a little bit that uh, there have been some impact of the advocacy, some of the very draconian and strange uh, provision have are gone, but still, uh, there are a lot of provisions there that we are engaged on. Uh, and there has been a multiple advocacy from the diplomatic missions have been involved in it. Uh, the international media is involved, the NGOs themselves are involved. And now I think we still have a number of steps remaining in advocacy. This public consultation is an opportunity. And according to international standard, they should run it very correctly. Even the Thai constitution, as Professor Vitit mentioned, requires all these things. But it again requires good faith engagement from the government side and following that. So this struggle is, uh, that is the issue. Like whether they lack capacity or whether they do not want to engage. These are two different things. Yes. So maybe I, I can add a little bit more uh, there. Uh, so. Uh, you know, I, I speak on two hats, <laughs> two two hats here, right? On uh, Amnesty International uh, Chair and also as a law lecturer. Um, my reflection on uh, reading the draft coming out of uh, uh, the Council of State it actually reflects reflected that uh, uh, the Council of State. Uh, 
consider many recommendations, many suggestions from mm. different organizations. So if you if you read uh, the the uh, they they summarize quite well uh, from both from governmental agency and also from uh, uh, NGOs or other type of organizations. And some already reflected uh, in the change of the draft. If you compare to the previous one, uh, we appreciate that that change. But there are also some uh, that uh, even though there are a lot of criticism or recommendation on the other way around, uh, this is not changed yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we have to uh, see f seek for more dialogue of why question. Uh, so why it did not change or what is the reason uh, that will, um, you know, the, the, the uh, decision maker will use as the reason to, to, to drive it in that way, not the way that many others suggest it to be. And I think uh, in, in our society, we need more of this kind of dialogue to talk about the reasons behind why things are, are decided in this way. And uh, um, maybe uh, on a positive uh, side, trying to be positive, I, I think this law, this draft might be a good chance for us to have more dialogues and inspire uh, from uh, uh, our conversation today. Uh, I do agree with Kun Sayamon that uh, to increase trust in the society, um, law might not be the best way, the best method to increase trust. There are many things that law is doing good. Mandatory, ac ac uh, mandatory transparency or accountability of governmental agencies, governmental officials, public companies, there are something, these are something that law proved to be very good at. But we also have some other methods, such as dialogue, collaboration, or try to get to know more about each other activities. Uh, these should be uh, uh, some more you know, methods uh, that will be less restrictive, but still achieving the same purpose. So if the purpose of the law is to encourage uh, more uh, activities that, it good for that are good for society, if the purpose is to build more trust between government and uh, civil society activities, if the purpose is to prevent the misuse of donation or charity, then we, we can like go directly to those aims rather than using some you know these tools that might distort these purposes. Um, um, as the chair of Amnesty International, we trying we trying to, to uh, uh, contact the governmental agencies. We are uh, collaborating with other uh, civil societies to uh, voice out our uh, idea, our suggestion, and maybe we can explore more about the alternative means that doesn't involve the restrictive laws that increase too much burden for association in this country so that uh, we can achieve the same aim. I, I still believe that uh, we are not on the opposite side. We are still in the same society and we, we, all, we all want for the, the, the betterment of the society. I still believe in that sense. Just that, but um, outwardly, the government or the authorities, those responsible with the drafting, claim that other countries have this sort of law, therefore we need it. And if you look at the, the reasoning attached to the draft, it says India has it, for example. But in fact, this copycat syndrome uh, draws upon many other countries also in terms of the sort of outward reasoning of the authorities. Having said that, it is not only the outward reasoning. What we're talking about here is the inward, the less open reasoning, the southern issue, the control factor, the security superimposition, and so on. And I think it's very important we, we highlight this as well in our understanding. There is both an outward and an inward, but the outward one is often superficial at the same time. And we have to debunk that. I mean, my way of debunking is to say, well, just because one country has a law doesn't mean you need it. You've got too many already, <laughs> uh, together with all the hidden stuff, you know. Uh, secondly, when we come to the leveraging that we're talking about here, we use whatever, uh, we should use whatever leveraging uh, we can. Um, we haven't talked that much about parliamentarians. And if the, the draft is going to go to parliament, let's work well with a certain understanding that this draft law is alienating. It is not a cooperative law, it's alienating. And it's bad for you, too, 
you politicians, you parliamentarians who want to build a society with some stakeholders, including NGOs, who could be your supporters too in a certain way. So I think that has to be worked upon, together with obviously the executive branch that we're talking about here. And having uh, mentioned the Ministry of Social Development, I have great respect for this ministry on many fronts, but it is not the most strong of ministries on some issues. And so it, whatever reasoning we use, we have to propel well to have some weight through the ministry to other power brokers along the way. Uh, interestingly, also, if we claim that certain provisions of this law, draft law, are in breach of the Constitution, there are avenues to go to the Constitutional Court. <laughs> but, but, it's a make or break issue, right? You win, you win, uh, you lose, you, you are stopped. So um, that's also another option. But I think to explore different options, and of course very uh, strong uh, civil society-based understanding, certain empathy. I mean, you probably read the other day that there was a poll which said the majority of the population are in favor of this law. Uh, we don't even know what they were asked. So easy to mislead or to have a, a leading question, et cetera. But, but uh, you know, sort of this advocacy through the Thai public is very important as well as with your support. On the internal side, that's one, but the external side, I think we should do a bit more. I mean, uh, I, I have great respect for special reporters and so on, humbly being one of them. But <laughs> the bug doesn't stop there. I, I think, you know, we should push it up to the High Commissioner and, and upwards, use whatever means we can. Uh, and yes, to negotiate with the embassy in whatever country, but it's got to be much more than that. We're talking about power play, real politic, and that's why we must push for a certain will to have that political way. Thank you. Thank you. One, yeah, go ahead. I'm talking about the countries of references that uh, the, the um, I think uh, government agency who engage in drafting this law look at. Um, uh, now I talk uh, on <laughs> the researcher uh, mode. I'm, su I'm switching to researcher mode. Uh, let me be a little bit uh, critical to the, the research methodology because we're talking about the law that will regulate, that will restrict, right? Uh, the right mode of research here should be looking at the countries that have no law as well, rather than looking at the two uh, countries that have law. And, and then <laughs> the, we, we should start from that, to look at the reason why there are so many countries in the world that, does, that do not have the blanket law governing NPO or NGOs in that country. First point. The second point is that there are some countries, uh, among the countries that, uh, the, uh, that has been ref referred in the drafting process, at least what have appeared in the uh, recent draft, there were uh, Cambodia, China, Kenya, UK, Japan, US, and India. Um, but we have to distinguish between the mandatory registration and voluntary registration. So this is, um, I think, in, in, a, in terms of academic research, this is quite a huge uh, 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 point of improvement. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm Michael Cole from the TV. Just to, you, you mentioned uh, I worked in China for quite some time. This looks a lot like a Chinese law. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it looks a lot like a Chinese law. It looks a lot like a Chinese law. Uh, I'm not expert in Chinese law, but at least uh, to look at the draft, uh, the summary of Chinese law is a little bit longer than the other country. Yeah, my name is Moritz. I work for the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. Uh, we've had an office here uh, since the 70s, and I wanted to ask you something, because you mentioned that <laughs> Chapter 5 uh, says that all the regulations we are under currently remain in place. and. Yes. It comes on top. Now, we currently have a mechanism where we um, have to submit plans and reports to the Ministry of Labor. Uh, we get visits by special branch and pictures taken and 
all of our financial transactions are being scrutinized already. Um, are you telling me that this law will not replace current mechanisms? Mm -hmm. is, is, are we it's gonna an report, addition. Are, are we going to report and have bureaucracy with two ministries? Yes. Yes. So, uh, uh, yes. The answer to that is yes. For the international <laughs> NGOs that are that are connected to underneath uh, that kind of law will also be covered by this law in Article Five. So this is this is. So, for instance, any sort of um, organization like here, the FCCT, which is registered as a uh, association under the Ministry of Interior, would also have to comply with this law. Any international NGO would have to comply with this NGO, even though they're also registered on the Ministry of Labor. So yes, it's, this is an, a, on top of all the existing mechanisms that you already comply with. To do the justice for, for the draft itself, uh, so there's actually one paragraph in section 19, paragraph 3, saying that the, the report that you already submitted uh, to one governmental agency will be automatically uh, uh, con uh, convey to the uh, this the, the ministry, supposedly this uh, mm. uh, 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 social development ministry, uh, to comply with this law. So there is also one provision uh, trying to facilitate this reporting process. But I'm quite wondering how, how it would happen because it's going to increase so much work for the social development ministry that they have to go to all ministry in, in, in <laughs> all ministry, all agencies and get the information like what kind of organization that already register with you, what kind of reports and then get all the report to them. Uh, this is a huge work for social development. And also there are some more other requirements and also power that these, uh, the existing agencies agency did not have uh, uh, within the existing law. Yeah. Uh, can I uh, end on a positive note? We've been very critical tonight, and I think rightfully so, but uh, my impression is that the second draft is better than the first. Um, I, I'm not an NGO expert uh, globally, but I, I know a couple of NGO laws, Cambodia, Indonesia, for example, very, very problematic. And uh, I really like that this law creates this uh, commission where civil society has a voice and is so the other NGO uh, laws, you have no lobby as an NGO. You have no, um, yeah, there's no arbitration, there's, there's nothing. Mm. And so um, I like it in this draft that uh, civil society is going to be represented. A question to all of you, do you see anything, anything positive or am I being too optimistic here? Thank you. Uh, I'll give you a short answer. <laughs> Part one is not bad. Part one is the uh, section, uh, the, the, the uh, coverage of, of uh, the committee that we set up, and then it finishes off with, with I think, uh, section 16 or something, which says you can get tax incentives. So all they need to do, actually, is to chop off part two, <laughs> if you really want to be simple. Uh, that's one way out. So we're not denying, we're not denying the better parts, but the better parts at the moment are overshadowed by the not so good parts, which appear in part two. Uh, all this stuff about having to do ultra reporting, ultra supervision, ultra sanctions, and so on. But part one, uh, I started off by saying uh, part one uh, has this committee, even though the name's a bit anomalous, but it is a possible entry point for incentives. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the international position is quite clear in terms of the preferred approach. It's to invite uh, NGOs uh, in the system to notify to be able to get tax incentives and other uh, incentivization rather than control and supervision. And you have, you have this control and supervision through other laws anyway. Thank you. ขอเพิ่มนิดนึงครับเชิญครับเอ่อคือที่ที่อาจารย์วิทิตบอกว่าจะถ้ามีการฟ้องศาลรัฐธรรมนูญน่ะก็มีความยากเพราะว่าในห
ซึ่งก็จะใช้ข้อยกเว้นที่มันกําหนดไว้ในรัฐธรรมนูญมาตรา25ซึ่งในรัฐธรรมนูญก่อนหน้านั้นจะไม่มีข้อความแบบนี้เลยที่เป็นข้อยกเว้นของการคุ้มครองสิทธิเสรีภาพถ้าหากว่ามีการฟ้องศาลรัฐธรรมนูญเนี่ยร่างกฎหมายเนี่ยก็มีในยะชั้นเชิงส่งเสริมซึ่งดราฟแรกเนี่ยจะไม่มีเชิงส่งเสริมแต่ดราฟที่2เนี่ยมีชั้นเชิงส่งเสริมแล้วก็ให้กระทรวงพัฒนาสังคมมาแล้วก็มีทั้งเชิงควบคุมไปในตัวโดยมีนัยยะข้อห้ามกับมีนัยยะของมีโทษทางอาญา So uh, just want to add to Professor v i t i t s uh, comment about uh, taking the draft to the constitutional court whether it will breach uh, the constitution I say it would be very difficult because in Article 25, 25th, uh, the 25th Article of the Constitution, it's um, you know it, it support all these different rights, but that it would it has this uh, provision saying that if it affect national security or public order, uh, sort of things can be carried out. So in the draft, uh, in the second draft of this uh, law, uh, there's some sort of wording of support, you know, tax incentive and all that sort of stuff. But they also have these provisions that if it impact national security. Then the organization in question can have their license revoked and criminal charges and all that sort of stuff. In the past, the constitution doesn't have this kind of wording, uh, but you know, with, with what we have right now, uh, you know, it will be very difficult to, to go through the to the court. And then, who has a question about if there will be a dialogue or dialogue? The Congress of the Society has a committee to work with the Department of Social Policy, and has also had a dialogue with. รัฐมนตรีกระทรวงพัฒนาสังคมแล้วก็ท่านรองนายกวิษณุซึ่งมาดูแลในส่วนที่เป็นกรรมการร่วมระหว่างองค์กรประชาสังคมแล้วกระทรวงพัฒนาสังคมเป็นฝ่ายเลขาเนี่ยคุยกันว่าให้มีการจัดทำกฎหมายในเชิงส่งเสริมซึ่งเป็นร่างแรกของกระทรวงพัฒนาสังคมแต่เมื่อมีการเสนอคณะรัฐมนตรีเนี่ยการสั่งการของท่านนายกเนี่ยให้กลับไปเขียนอีกแบบหนึ่งซึ่งพอพอพอเป็นนัยยะลักษณะแบบนั้นเนี่ยมันทําให้เกิดความไม่ไว้วางใจกันระหว่างองค์กรประชาสังคมกับรัฐบาลสถานการณ์ตอนนี้เนี่ยดิฉันคิดว่ามันเลยมันเลยของการพูดคุยแล้วเพราะว่าตอนที่ครั้งแรกเริ่มเนี่ยมีการพูดคุยกันแล้วก็มีการพูดคุยกันอย่างหนักว่าทําไมถึงต้องมีกฎหมายเชิงส่งเสริมเพราะว่าองค์กรภาคสังคมอ่ะต้องหาเงินทุนของตัวเองมาตลอดในการทํางานโดยที่เป็นภาระและโดยที่ผลการแก้ปัญหาเนี่ยก็เรียกว่ามาจากองค์กรภาคสังคมเนี่ยแต่รัฐบาลไม่เคยมีการอุดหนุนเลยซึ่งซึ่งส่วนเนี้ยรัฐบาลควรจะถ้าเป็นไปตามเป้าหมายการพัฒนายิ่งยืนก็ต้องมององค์กรภาคสังคมเป็นหุ้นส่วนการพัฒนาเป็นพาร์ทเนอร์ชิพเขาควรจะต้องมีการส่งเสริมซึ่งในยะแบบนี้มันทําให้ดิฉันคิดว่ามันทําให้มาถึงขั้นนี้เนี่ยองค์กรภาคสังคมการไดอะล็อกมันเป็นไปนเรื่องยากเพราะว่ามันต้องอยู่บนความไว้วางใจซึ่งกันและกันลักษณะแบบนี้แต่สิ่งที่กสมตระหนักเรื่องนี้ก็คือว่าก็จะเราก็คงจะหาช่องทางในการคุยกับรัฐบาลในเชิงให้ข้อมูลอีกด้านหนึ่งเพื่อพิจารณาค่ะแต่ถ้าจะบอกว่ามาให้เป็นตัวกลางระหว่างภาคสังคมกับรัฐบาลนี่คงจะเป็นไปได้ยากแล้วตอนนี้ค่ะ <laughs> yeah so uh, in terms of dialogue you know I mean It, there, there were dialogues in the past between NGOs uh, with, uh, through the Social Development Ministry and uh, De Deputy Prime Minister Wisanu as well. And initially, the first draft drafted by the Social Development Ministry through this dialogue that was tabled to the cabinet was quite supportive. The NGO, I mean, the heart of the dialogue was that the NGO never had any uh, financial support. They had to find sources of funding, and they're, 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 they were saying that maybe the government can be more supportive. And that was how the initial. Sort of dialogue and draft was 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 tabled, but then when it went to cabinet, the PM, the Prime Minister, uh, uh, told them to rewrite it in a different way. So when that happened, uh, the, the trust was broken down. So uh, from my perspective, you know, it is very hard uh, to 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 earn uh, that trust, to rebuild that trust. But the, the trust already shattered, and and the time of dialogue maybe have already passed because this is how it was treated initially. Uh, you know, the, the Human Rights Commission will try its own way to 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 reach out to the government. But we cannot be sort of the 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 agency, the, the go between, uh, you know, between the civil society and the government. Uh, but this is sort of the context of how it happened uh, in terms of dialogue. Um, I, would like to, I would like to add more thing about 
uh, the positive side of this law uh, and how it can be more positive. Um, I, I, I agree with Kun Sayamun that uh, uh, the dialogue should have been done more actually about this law. And, uh, and yeah, when, when Ajahn with it mentioned the first part of the law itself that seemed to focus on encouragement, facilitation. And actually, I just, uh, we, it's, it is clear in the, in the drafting, uh, uh, summary of the drafting process that it talk about uh, foreign laws. And actually, when we look at the foreign laws, uh, at least one law mentioned here is the Japanese law that talk about voluntary registration of NPO. And that law, if you look at the contents, it includes lengthy uh, the tax exemption and also other means of promotion that the, uh, the, the government should be studying. This, this law and also many, and I believe that there are, ma there are many other laws in other country promoting or designing a good uh, uh, incentive for uh, uh, so civil society to do public goods. And actually those are something that should be uh, considered uh, by the government as alternative to incentivize uh, more information from the uh, N NGO and POs, and at the same time, encourage them to find more funding uh, for doing good things. Yeah. Well, I think we've uh, really come to the end of a very uh, interesting and thoughtful panel. Uh, there's been a lot of back and forth. There's been a lot of complicated discussions about provisions of law, but also wider uh, examinations of motivations and the, the initial question of why. Um, so I want to thank all the panelists for coming tonight. Uh, tremendous job by you all. Thank you so much. I also want to thank uh, all the people who came out today to, uh, to listen in and also the people online. Um, obviously, this is going to be a topic that is going to be a major topic uh, over the course of 2022. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to keep you updated and perhaps and have another event further down the line when we have uh, new uh, bends in the road, new uh, developments about this very important uh, law and its impact on civil society. So uh, on behalf of the FCCT, thank you again for coming and good night.